Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is John Hamry, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to what's going to be a wonderful uh, hour with Jay Raymond, General Jay Raymond. He, uh, you know, I, all of us read back in the history books about the pioneering work that Hap Arnold did. None of us knows how hard it is to create a, a new service, and we're we are fortunate today to have the space equivalent of Hap Arnold, who is charting new horizons every day to try to help strengthen America's security by building a stronger space force for us all. And we're so fortunate to have him here. Um, you know, we're two years into this journey uh, and it is, uh, think about what it's like to establish something new in such a short period of time. You've got all the issues you have to work through of personnel and resources and mission and pri priorities, po public po uh, policy priorities. It is an enormous task and for General Raymond to carve out so much time with us today is really a privilege. So Todd, let me turn to you to get this going for real. Uh, we're really delighted to, that you get us started. And again, General Raymond, thank you. We're honored to have you here. Sure, thank Todd. you. And thank you everyone in the online audience uh, for joining us. It's going to be a great discussion with General Raymond. Um, and, you know, I want to give everyone a heads up that we're going to be taking questions from the audience. And if you want to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A function there uh, in Zoom. You can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, you click on that. Uh, you can review questions other people have asked and upvote them uh, or ask your own question if you don't see uh, your topic addressed already. Uh, but without further ado, I want to get right into uh, the discussion. Um, you know, I've got the unenviable task of introducing a man who needs no introduction. Uh, General Jay Raymond is the chief, the first chief of space operations. Um, and prior to this job, of course, uh, he's had a stellar career uh, in the Air Force. Uh, he was previously the commander of Air Force Space Command. Uh, he was also for a time dual-hatted as the commander of United States Space Command uh, and has a, a career uh, you know, working in the space uh, parts of the Air Force. Uh, but I would note he did get his start in the ROTC program a fellow ROTC grad from Clemson University in 1984. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's really our pleasure to welcome General Raymond back. Uh, it's been a couple of years, I think, uh, okay. since we've had you at a CSIS event. So it's great to have you back. Uh, so I want to turn it over to you uh, for some opening remarks before we get into the questions. Well, thanks, Todd. And first, let me begin by saying happy birthday. Uh, uh, it's it's great that you're spending your day with, with me, at least a part of your day with me. And I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to have this conversation. It's, it, I find, I've always found uh, the interaction that I've had with CSIS to be uh, extremely valuable. And I, I get way more out of it than what I give, and that's for sure. And, and a lot of that is due uh, in credit to you and, and clearly Dr. Hamry. And so Dr. Hamry, again, thank you, sir, for, for your long, uh, many years of service and, and for your wise counsel that you've provided us uh, over the last several years as we've we were initially in the in the stages of thinking through what what the organizational structure for national security space should be uh, and then um, now that we're up and running helping us uh, continuing to help us think through uh, some of the meaty challenges that 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 we face and again my my greatest appreciation to to both and appreciate the opportunity what i thought i'd do i did a session yesterday and i know there's probably a couple people that were on last yesterday's session and this uh, today's session. So I'll, I'll work through this pretty quickly, but I'd, I'd like to at least set the stage with kind of a little bit of where we've been over the last two years, but more importantly, what's on our plate uh, for for this uh, moving into our third year as we just uh, about a month, just not quite a month past our second birthday. And as I said this, uh, as I've said this repeatedly, if you look at the amount of work and progress that has been made uh, in just uh, two short years, it's pretty remarkable. I would have flunked the test. Uh, I, I had laid out some, some uh, big 
uh, goals up front when I was first put in this position of things that I thought an independent service needed to do. And if you look at, at where we are with those, we've, we've made a, a really uh, uh, great progress. There's still a ton of work to do. Uh, but I thought what I would do is just give a little bit of sense for, for where I think we are. Uh, you know, as, as I looked at it, uh, one of the things we want to do is, is uh, design the force to be able to, to move at speed and to meet the demands that we're seeing today as this domain shifted from a, a benign peaceful domain to a, to a more contested war fighting domain. And so we completely reorganized and have all the major building blocks in place. We've got a headquarters in place, and it's a very innovative, small purposely built force uh, designed to be small, lean, uh, and fast. The challenge with that is you have to operate inside the bureaucracy of the Department of Defense. So we're all just balancing. Are we, are we, do we have, do we have that balance right, if you will? We've stood up three field commands that are mission focused commands focused on space operations, space acquisitions, and space training, tactics, development, readiness, testing, all the things that we didn't have. Um, I think we've, we've strengthened our intelligence part of this significantly. We became an 18th member of the IC. We have built an organization for intelligence. Uh, we have operational level intelligence. We have then put those experts on operations floors with our mission focused Delta. So we have operators and intel experts sitting side by side doing left seat, right seat, and being able to, to deliver advantage that we never had that capability before in the Air Force. On the personnel side, we went in on 20 December 2019, uh, one person in the Space Force, uh, laughingly people called me patient zero. Uh, and now we've got 13,000 as of uh, today, 13,525, half, half military, half civilians, uh, including 720 folks that have, have volunteered, all these folks have volunteered to come over to the Air Force, but have volunteered to come over from the the Army and the Navy and the Marines. We've built a human capital strategy, which is a really forward leaning, bold document. We've got promotion boards that we put in place, force development, uh, completely overhauled the force development. And one of the things I'm really proud of is we completely overhauled the recruiting process. We have the luxury of only recruiting about 500 enlisted guardians a year and just shy of that on the officer side. Uh, that allows us to do things differently. And so rather than having every single recruiting station pick the first you know, 400 that come in off the street, what we've done is what we call centralized booking, where they they get the candidates and then we pull a board together uh, and we make those applicants fill out data sheets and, and questionnaires on why they want to be in Space Force. And, and so we can then better evaluate whether they're a good fit. And now we pick the best 400. Uh, we're the most selective service that that is out there. We've met all of our recruiting needs and we have... Um, pools of folks that are qualified waiting to come in knocking on the door of the camp so we've completely completely shifted that and our human capital development and the the talent that we're attracting is a significant benefit we've seen significant benefit after establishing the space force and on the on the diversity side we went from a 17 percent diverse force to those that we're we're uh, assessing now is that the 30 I think it's 35 uh, percent uh, diversity uh, uh, the, of the folks that we're bringing in. So we're excited about the team we're building. We built our second budget. Our first budget was built really when we were like a month old or a month or two old. So really the budget that we just put forward is our first big budget. I think you're going to see that to be a very bold budget uh, uh, when it comes out, uh, when the department finalizes that and, and we'll really focus on the shift towards resiliency. We've completely overhauled how we do capability development. The National Defense Authorization Act just uh, uh, task the Secretary of Defense to delegate to the Space Force the force design work. I hope to be able to, to go into that in our, our Q&A session. Um, the JROC has, has, um, has uh, designated the Space Force as the lead joint uh, uh, lead service for joint space requirements, as you would expect. So we've got that uh, done. We've completely overhauled our acquisition uh, processes and organizations, our organizations, and we've worked that very closely with, with Congress to make sure that, that uh, we've got that uh, right. And then for the first time ever, we built a test program, which we haven't had. Uh, we've had a, a minor uh, test program in the past. Now we have a comprehensive test program that we've got to build, but we've designed it and, and excited for that. We've drafted our, our first two doctrine documents now. Uh, we've also been integrating as a member of the Joint Chiefs, integrating more effectively in the, in the national defense strategies that will come out, the national military strategy that will come out, the, the joint war funding contract that will come out. You'll see, a, a, in my opinion, a better integration of space into those documents and the whole integrated deterrence piece. And uh, the other thing that I would say is we have really robusted our international partnerships, uh, which is key. Uh, and that's an area that, that 
uh, we have really made uh, some significant strides and to, to transform our international partnerships from one way data sharing partnerships um, to two way operationally beneficial uh, partnerships, mutually beneficial partnerships for us and, and our partners. So that's kind of doing all the work and, and getting all the pieces in place to then uh, this year really uh, continuing that advances and continuing to deliver on these these uh, uh, these areas for this coming year our big priorities are force design getting that right uh, doing the design work and the analytical rigor underneath that and to bring the department together and develop force designs that are resilient by by their design uh, we began with missile warning missile tracking we've delivered that it's great work brought the, the department together uh, reducing duplication reducing uh, uh, making sure that everybody's rolling in the same direction uh, the work that we're doing right now is an aoa on uh, the first part of tactical level isr which is our ground moving target indicator uh, so we're doing that work and there, there's a broader requirements work going on on what uh, the department's tactical level isr uh, re uh, requirements are and we're doing that work with the intelligence intelligence community and then there's a space data transport layer uh, you know any fight in the future is going to have to get information from space, transport it around the globe and bring it down to the ground. And that transport layer is really critical. And we're doing the design work of that this year as well. Uh, on the force development part, we want to we want to finalize the, the concept of our total force concept of bringing uh, the total force relationship for the space force. We we studied that last year. The, the law this year tells us to do some more study on that. We want to get that across the finish line uh, this year. Um, force generation and force readiness. We've built force generation models and force readiness models that, that we're in the process of building. We're, we're about complete with those for, for space forces, which are more employed in place rather than deployable, uh, which is generally how uh, the department's readiness models uh, have been focused. We're, we're on the force presentation. We're building force presentation mechanisms to present space force presentation of forces to all the combatant commands around the globe, standing up space force components in those in those uh, uh, combatant commands in addition to, to US Space Command. On the acquisition side, although acquisition isn't a uh, service chief function, it's more of a secretary function, uh, we want to get the Space Force acquisition official in, the, the Assistant Secretary for, for Space Acquisition and Integration uh, individuals uh, been nominated, uh, and we'll go through the confirmation process. And, and upon confirmation, we want to get them in the seat uh, and then have the SAE responsibilities separate from, from the Air Force. Uh, the law now says we can do that no later than 1 October of 22, rather than waiting for 1 October of 22. So we're eager to get that, that uh, done and, and, and moving out as well. And then we're going to continue to work on the strategy piece. The thing that I would say, the other big area and the most important area for any services are people. Um, when you have a service that's only 13,500 people uh, in size uh, currently, and we'll grow a little bit here at the end of this, by the end of this fiscal year, maybe up to about 15,000-ish, uh, we're still really small. That affords us some opportunities to, to apply more art than science when you do professional development. And we've built this strategy that we're excited for, and we're looking forward to fully implementing that uh, this year as well. Uh, Todd, I could go on for hours. I really want to get to your questions and dialogue and, and the questions for others, but I hope that at least sets the table for uh, where we are, the work that we've been doing. And, and again, happy to happy to have a dialogue on any topic that you, you'd like to talk about. Uh, that, that's a great introduction, and I've been jotting down some notes here, <laughs> uh, things to dig in uh, some more detail on. Um, I, I guess I want to start with kind of big picture, looking back at the, the history of the last two years it's been made and the, the stand up of a new branch of the military. Um, you know, the whole debate that led up to the creation of the Space Force was was really, you know, very political, not necessarily partisan, because uh, you had members of both parties on either side of the issue, but it was, you know, a lot of fierce debate about whether or not this was needed, um, and, you know, the White House uh, weighing in on it kind of later in the, in the debate, but then the broader public uh, starting to become much more aware of it. You have a Netflix TV series <laughs> about your service. Um, so I want to ask you about that because I tell you, I couldn't even finish watching the first season, but maybe maybe I'm just too close to things. Um, but, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of get your reflection on this as that whole debate was taking place. You know, you were, you know, right there doing the job, right? Um, 
when did you first reach the conclusion in your own mind that a separate military service for space was necessary? Yeah, you know, I, uh, it's a great question. And I, I've lived that, you know, that, uh, that debate really picked up uh, strongly in the end of 2016. Uh, I took command of Air Force Space Command in October of 2016. And I remember walking off the stage and my uh, public affairs uh, officer said, hey, sir, would you mind doing a little press engagement, local press engagement? They're waiting out front to ask you questions. And, and I said, I'm happy to do so. But they said, you know, sir, this is going to be this is going to be a bunch of softball questions. It's great to be back in Colorado Springs, uh, you know, uh, it's great to be back, you know, at Air Force Base Command, and this will be easy. The very first question I got, the very first question I got uh, was, General Raymond, do you think space should be in the Air Force? And it it, it kind of caught me off guard. I had come to Air Force Base Command having served as the Air Force A3 in the Air Force. I had some, as we all do when you, you know you're going to take over an organization, I had some thoughts in mind of where I was going to lead this, this uh, organization. And in those thoughts, uh, those thoughts did not contain uh, standing up a separate combatant command and then standing up a, a separate service. Um, however, uh, not long after that, I would say probably within a year, as in that seat as the Air Force Space Command commander, uh, what changed was the activities of our of our adversaries or challengers, whatever, however you want to describe. It. And if you look at what China are pacing challenge. Uh, was doing and the speed in which they were moving out on, uh, it became clear to me that we had to do something differently. I love the Air Force. I've been an airman for 35 years. I've been a guardian for two, uh, 35 and a half years and, and two. So uh, coming up on 38 years of service. I love the Air Force. And, and the Air Force built the world's best space force. But the Air Force has is a, is a service with a vast amount of responsibilities. And I, I desperately saw the need for uh, increased focus and an elevation in responsibilities. And when you elevate from an Air Force major command to an independent service, your, your, your voice gets elevated in a way and your attention gets elevated in a way that's, that's valuable. You have a, an increased uh, voice in requirements. You have an increased voice in, 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 uh, in budget. You have an increased voice in force development. Um, uh, that's one of the areas that Congress pushed on you. Know, why, why aren't space experts being promoted at the same rates as the Air Force. I'll tell you, all of that's been solved. All of that's been solved as you elevate space to an independent service. And so, yeah, I have an, an enhanced voice in, uh, in our, with our allies and our partners. Uh, I have an enhanced voice as a member of the Joint Chiefs in getting uh, space integrated into the business of the department. And I would tell you, a service has, has a, a greater center of mass, if you will, to, to attract the unity of effort that we need to get something across the finish line. So having been the person in the Air Force that commanded the Air Force part of space, uh, or the space part of the Air Force, and now being a service chief, there is without a doubt, uh, there's no comparison to, to our posture today. Now, again, with a ton of work left to do, uh, and there'll always be work to do, but with a ton of work left to do, uh, there's no question in my mind that we are better posture today, and it was the right answer. But it was based on what the the threat was doing that really changed my calculus. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, you know, part of what you mentioned, one of the reasons, one of the motivations of standing up the Space Force was the personnel side of it, right? To create that cadre of space personnel. Um, and now, you know, as an independent service, you've got the recruit, train, and equip responsibility, and you own these people. Um, and so I just wanted to get kind of an update from you on you know, how is that going in terms of generating your own, you know, unique Space Force culture uh, people? And, you know, what kind of changes are you looking at in terms of the talent management system, uh, career options, you know, different things like up or out promotion, lateral entry, you know, what kind of things are you looking at to transform your workforce? All the above, all, all of the above. Uh, and so let's start from the beginning on assessments. We completely changed how we assess people. And I'll tell you the assessments that we're getting both on the officer side and the enlisted side, not that we were bad before, but I'll tell you the talent we're getting is, is pretty incredible. You know, just as an example, prior to the Space Force, out of the Air Force Academy, we got 13 cadets that came to space, 13 out of 1,000. Uh, first year, just months after we stood up, we got 68. This last year, we got 118. 
Uh, and if you look at the talent, it's, it's not just numbers, it's road scholars, it's wing commanders, it's uh, NCAA track star, you know, number one athletes, it's NFL, you know, we've got a, a person in the Space Force that's on the Red uh, Washington football team's roster. So it's, 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 it's unbelievable the talent on a whole spectrum that, that, that we're getting. Um, as you look at development, uh, the, you know, for an enlisted airman uh, or a guardian today, uh, we don't do promotion testing anymore. We, you know, in the Air Force, everybody had, you know, in the list, they took promotion tests. I was really lucky that I was an officer because if I had to take pass a test to get promoted, I'd probably still be a lieutenant. But we don't do that anymore. We meet a board because he can. We only have 3,000 or so enlisted guardians. We'll meet a board for everybody. Uh, on on, um, on uh, uh, assignments, we can, we can do a little bit more, again, apply a little bit more art to, to say what's best for you in your career. We want to give people opportunities to, to go to NASA for an assignment, come back, go to, go to industry for an assignment, come back. We want to be much more portable. Uh, our total force strategy, uh, I think, will help us with that as, as we go forward. Um, on uh, on uh, lateral transfers, we want to bring folks in from industry and from others in, and, and I have the ability to bring somebody in and bring them in as a colonel. If they're a vice president of an organization based on their experience, bring them in and say, hey, work for two years, work on this project and, and then go back. We're looking at all of those authorities and, and more. And without a doubt, I mean, there is no comparison without a doubt. Uh, uh, our, our, we are in much uh, a much better position today than we were just a couple of years ago as it relates to that human capital development. And we are trying to, to start with a clean sheet of paper, uh, think very differently uh, and to build a, a service um, for the next hundred years, not, you know, not, I, I told our team, we kind of have two risks. If we go into this and just iterate our way down the path and become nothing more than an Air Force that changes a little bit here and there, we've missed a huge opportunity. And so the, the two risks are making sure that we, we're thinking bold enough. And then the second risk is if, when we think bold, making sure that we can get it through the bureaucracy. Uh, and 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 we're, that we find ourselves in that sweet spot of of being bold and but not reckless and making sure that we can and if we do it right, I really believe we can be a a incubator for change across the broader department. You can try something with a service our size and maybe it'll scale to scale more broadly uh, across the across the, the broader DoD. Yeah, I think you know that, that is one of the exciting you know opportunities here, right? Is that you can yeah. try things like lateral entry and and prove sure. it out and figure out you know how to work the kinks out of the system and make it uh, work as intended. Let um, me give you one more example, and I'll, I'll be quick because I know you want to get to questions, uh, other questions. But um, we had a gentleman; he was an Air Force Academy cadet. He was a Division One wrestler at the Air Force Academy. Incredible shape. And he, he has allowed me to talk about this. So I'm not violating any HIPAA rules. He, he's allowed me to, he's told this story and has given me permission to, but he came, he, while he was at the academy, he was diagnosed with type one diabetes. There has never been a person that has been, that's been brought into the service with type one diabetes. They came to us and said, he said, hey, I really want to serve. Can I join the Space Force? If you look at the Space Force, we largely do our work from home. We do have deployable capabilities and we go around the world. But you can have a very full career in the continental United States. If you look at the, the advances made in technology for monitoring blood sugar levels and things, you said absolutely will we'll bring in. So for the first time ever, we have a, and so that's just an example of where we're trying to think differently based on our service and where we can get some talent. Uh, we've got another gentleman right now who's, uh, um, at, at Harvard, uh, with this, uh, we're working through the same issue. So we're 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 excited about trying things different. All right, um, yeah. So I want to look a, a little more to the forward. Um, what's coming in the next few years? You talked a bit about force design and how the Space Force has gotten more authority um, to do to play a larger role in force design. Can you you know tell us a little bit more about that and what are you doing to carry out those responsibilities? Uh, and what are the products we could be seeing in the next year or two? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we heard loud and clear from Congress and, and, and more broadly, uh, and one of the things that we've been wanting to do, we get we hear about the acquisition process is broken. You got to speed up acquisition. It takes too long. If, if I want to buy a, a GPS satellite 
Uh, Todd, if you were a GPS satellite and I wanted to buy a clone of you, it's a five-year deal uh, to buy a clone. That's not, that's not what we need. The challenge is you can't just attack it at the acquisition side. You have to design the force uh, to enable you to do that well. And so we really didn't have that function uh, in the department that we needed to on, on the space side. That's typically uh, services responsibility to do. And then the Secretary of Defense is the ultimate, you know, force design um, uh, approval authority, if you will. But, but we have built a very small team. What we don't want to do is we don't want to create bureaucracy. We're not about building big bureaucracy. We're about building capabilities. And so we built a very small team um, uh, of about, I think it's about 70 people. They're PhD level folks. Um, we, we call it the Space Warfighting Analysis Center. They're, they're PhD level folks coupled with our best operators and our best intelligence experts. And we put them together and we say, okay, go design. And we prioritize it because it was a small group of folks. And we have to, we have to look across all of the capabilities that we operate and do and make this you know, transition to a, from a small number of very exquisite satellites to a more defendable architecture. Uh, and so we started with our highest priority, and that's missile warning, missile tracking. Uh, if you look across the department, there's five different uh, organizations that have a role in that. You've got the Space Systems Command, Space Rapid Capabilities Office, um, uh, the Space Development Agency, MDA, and then ERO. And we said, okay, we're going to bring everybody together, and we're going to, this analytical team that we built is going to kind of lead this effort. And at the end of about a year's worth of work, they came out with a force design that everybody agreed to. And it's a, it's a, it's a really ex exquisite force design, uh, elegant force design uh, that provides resiliency by the design of that, uh, of that force structure. Um, and so what we now, and so now once you do that, then you have to work the funding for that and then the acquisition pieces of that. Uh, but we've got that done. And now we are, as I mentioned in my opening comments, there's other things that we have to design. And so tactical level ISR is another big one. We're focused on GMTI at first to make sure that we're not duplicating what the intelligence community does to make sure that we're building relevant capabilities. Uh, uh, and then the ability to transport data uh, in, in the space domain is another area that we're really focusing on this year. So we're gonna deliver that. When we deliver that, when I've talked to industry, what industry has told me is they don't want me to come forward with a big stack of requirements documents and drop a, stack of requirements documents on the desk and say, hey, go build this. Because they'll say, hey, that's not the way I would build it. Uh, yeah, I, we wouldn't build it that way. Why, why are you dictating to me? Why, why don't you have an earlier conversation? So what we've done is we've, we've also, as we shift to a more digital service, uh, we've taken the, the, that design architecture and all the threat data that we have, and we, we've put it into computer models. And, and using uh, uh, coding, we've coded all of this. And we had an industry day a few months ago where we handed it all out at the right appropriate classification levels and we controlled who came to the meeting and we handed it out to about 180 something different companies. And we said, okay, after years worth of work, here's, the, here's what we come up with. What, how would you do this? And, and getting early input from, from them uh, uh, if, the, if they want to uh, uh, is, is, uh, would be a value. That same computer model helps us, helps us um, do the acquiring of it with digital engineering helps us helps us test those capabilities to make sure that they can survive a threat. Helps us train our operators uh, you know, with the with the digital models. So we see value there across the board. Uh, we've completed the first one again with missile warning, missile tracking. We're working through some others, and what you will see going forward is a very open dialogue with industry on what we've come up with, seeking their their um, inputs to make it better, and then bring unit of, effort, unit of effort across the department to deliver at, at speed. Uh, and that's that's been our focus. I want to dig in on a couple of those areas then. So in the next generation, you know, missile warning, missile tracking architecture, um, are we potentially going to see changes to existing programs uh, as a result of that? Uh, and will that be in the, you know, something we'll see in the next budget request? And, and what can you tell us about that architecture? Is it going to be in GEO? Leo, Mio, uh, polar orbits, or all of the above, or you know, uh, what is that looking like? What can you tell and us? So, you know, my career dissipation light will come on if I get too specific on what a budget might or might not be when, when the department hasn't completed that work. But what I would tell you is, um, you know, in in all cases when we do this work, uh, I, what what I what 
what I don't have the luxury of doing is telling the nation, hey, uh, we're going to turn off GPS and we're going to turn off missile warning and we're going to turn off COM and we're going to turn off whatever. And in about 10 years, we'll come back to you with a new architecture. That doesn't work. You got you to operate what you got and make this transition. And so as we do this, we've had to come up with a bridging strategy. And, and we will do that by, by, um, uh, by the capability that, that we're, the, the mission that we're addressing at the time, this, in this case, missile warning, missile tracking. In the, in the case of missile warning, missile tracking, we wanted to do two things. One, make it more defendable, and two, make it more relevant for the, for the threat classes of missiles that, that we're seeing. Um, and so um, I think what you'll see is on the, on the old capabilities versus the new capabilities, you'll see us do a bridging strategy. And we evaluated everything from, again, notionally turning it all off and saying, we'll be back in 10 years. We probably could go faster that way uh, uh, to keeping everything up and, and building new and, and you know, the, the budget implications of that. I think we've, we've uh, in our work, have come up with a, a right mix of being able to manage risk as we make a transformation. But beyond that, I, I guess I'd, I'd say wait and see for the budget, and I'd, I'd prefer to keep my job for a while longer. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll have to ask you back after the budget comes Please out. Please do. Uh, Please do. Um, you know, and so then you also talked about tactical ISR and building a ground-moving target indication right. capability from space. Right. Um, you know, can, you, you mentioned an AOA uh, for that. It, so does that mean that that program, if you will, is still pre-milestone A? It's still in the very early stages? Um, and do you envision, you know, a potential role for commercial capabilities in providing some of that? Because there are a lot of synthetic aperture radar companies, private companies out there that are building and launching capabilities that have the potential to do GMTI. Is, is that going to be part of the architecture that Space Force looks at? Yeah, so let me, I'll, I'll address that specifically, but let me raise it up one notch for a second and say across all of our force design work, we're interested in that. We want to leverage commercial uh, more than, than, than we've been able to do in the past. And I think if you design a force, so let's just say, you know, one way of doing business is I'm making this up. This is a complete made up numbers. Uh, $4 billion satellite or a proliferation of smaller, or less exquisite satellites, a broader part of the industrial base and a broader part of our allies and partners from around the world might be able to contribute more to that proliferated, uh, less exquisite. And so we want to be able to do that more broadly. But in the case of, of, of GMTI, the Air Force made this decision a few years ago in the bomb. They have a capability called JSTARS that provides this capability. It's, a, it's an old system that was at end of life, if you will. Uh, it was also not designed for the current strategic environment that we face uh, uh, with our pacing challenge being China. Uh, and so the thought was the Air Force made a decision to let's think differently and think of, about a multi-domain approach. Um, they were going down that path when the Air Force, when the Space Force stood up, and then that program transferred to the Space Force. The very first thing that we did uh, that, that, uh, from the Space Force side was we're not going to, we're going to reduce the classification of this uh, and because it was, it was classified at a level that we didn't talk about it. Uh, and now we reduce that classification we can talk about it to allow us to, to have more fuller conversations with industry and with partners and to be able to to uh, attract that. The other thing that we're doing is this work we're doing with the AOA is, is in concert with the intelligence community. Uh, this is something we're gonna work in partnership. What, we're, what we don't wanna do is have the intelligence community build something then us build something that duplicates it. Uh, and, and so the work that we're doing is, is doing the design to figure out what exists today. What's the requirements? What exists today? Can it meet those requirements? If it can't, what are the areas that it can't? And how best then would you go address that again between the department and the, and the intelligence community. And I would say more broadly about tactical level ISR, not just GMTI, we're doing the same thing as the lead requirements, as the joint space requirements lead for the department. We're gonna work with all the other services, come up with what the, the ISR requirements are across all the services, figure out what exists today, figure out where the gaps are. And then in working again with partnerships and in collaboration of commercial industry allies partners and others to figure out how best to go to go address that that's that's the methodology we'll take for all for all of them 
Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the role of allies and partners in, in building out our space architecture. And so I want to turn uh, for a moment to talk about NATO. And of course, uh, NATO this week just released its first space policy for the alliance. Um, and, and, you know, over the past few years, NATO has started to focus much more recognizing space as a warfighting domain. I just want to say, you know, just ask from your perspective, has that change the way that you've been in interacting uh, with our NATO allies when it comes to space? And are there additional areas where you'd like to improve space cooperation with NATO? Absolutely. So uh, back right shortly after we established U.S. Space Command, been, uh, we established that in August of 2019. I think it was probably September or October. I don't quote me on the date, but it was shortly after, a month or two after that. I went over and I was. I had the opportunity to brief the NATO Military Committee on space, and in that discussion, I talked about the the changing strategic environment. I talked about space being a warfighting domain. I talked about the need for for greater alignment with NATO. Um, I talked about NATO has things called centers of excellence, and that might consider space centers of excellence. I talked about uh, better integration with NATO through what we call the Director of Space Forces, and maybe. Um, aligning the director of space forces for uh USAFE to also be that for 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 nato and all of those things have happened so and i'm not saying this because of my speech but like two weeks after i gave that talk uh, nato came out and made uh declared space an operational domain uh this this past year they stood up a space center of excellence in uh, or setting it up in in toulouse france uh, they've stood up a NATO C2 cell center at Ramstein, Germany. The Air Command commander, which is the USAFE commander, uh, it falls under his his command. And we have dual headed the Dirt Space Four, and we now have integrated uh, U.S. space experts into that C2 cell. Um, I think more broadly, you know, we have a bunch of bilateral relationships uh, with which are largely data sharing relationships with lots of countries around the globe, and including many, many of our NATO partners, bilateral relationships. We also have an initiative called CSPO, Combined Space Operations. And that's where uh, the Five Eyes plus France and Germany come together as a collective body called CSPO. And we, we uh, uh, do work on policy and, and uh, force design and, how do you, and integration and messaging and norms of behavior, all those types of things. What NATO also allows us to do is broaden that because, you know, NATO has has the, uh, the 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 30 countries, but they also have, what I learned when my visit to NATO is they also have a much greater web of partners beyond that. And so I, we really believe there's value there, a deterrence value, because uh, again, our primary mission is to deter conflict from beginning or extending into space. That's, that's what NATO is all about. Uh, uh, and we think there's ways to, uh, to leverage that. In fact, I'm so, uh, passionate about this. We just, and we only have 21 general officers across the entire United States Space Force. Uh, it's a really small service. We put one of those general officers and we assign that general officer to NATO. And so we have uh, a, a, a Brigadier General, Space Force Brigadier General assigned at NATO to, uh, to doing other things, but one of his kind of additional duties, if you will, is make sure that we are well integrated on the, on the space side as well. Well, and you know, speaking of NATO, um, would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Russian ASAT test uh, that was back in November. Uh, of course, this is something, you know, that my team here at CSI has pays close attention to, and that's going to feature prominently in the next update of our, our uh, space threat assessment. Um, but I just wanted to get from you, what was your reaction when you first learned uh, the Russian ASAT test? Disappointment. Um... You know, I, they obviously have been, it, it wasn't lost on us at all that, that they view space as a warfaring domain, that they're building capabilities. I, you know, I, I talked very publicly uh, for the first time back in, um, I think it was no, uh, it was January, February of 2020 about the, uh, what I described as the nesting doll satellite that positioned up next to uh, a, a U.S. satellite. So that, that was not surprising that they're building these capabilities, uh, I was disappointed that that they tested it in such a reckless and irresponsible manner. Uh, that, you know, that the satellite that they destroyed was pretty high. Uh, that that debris is going to be with us for a while. That debris is going to come down. Uh, 
eventually, and it's going to come down through uh, the low Earth orbit belt and, and put at risk uh, things that are below it, which includes the International Space Station and the astronauts that are on board. Uh, we take uh, our role, our job of being space traffic, man of doing the space traffic management function very, very seriously. We share that data broadly with the world. We pay a special attention to protecting and defending uh, the astronauts that are on board the ISS. And I thought it was a complete irresponsible uh, test that didn't have to happen. Yeah, I'd love to be able to ask the same question to the cosmonauts that are on the International Space Station. What did they think? when they had to duck and cover. <laughs> um, yeah, but related to that, you know, what do you think are some of the core tenets of being a responsible actor in space? And how is the Space Force leading by example? Yeah, well, I, first of all, I'm a, I've, I've been a big proponent. In fact, I wrote an op-ed here just recently on uh, the, the need for uh, uh, norms of behavior in space. I, I've I've described it in the past as the wild, wild west. You know, there's not a whole lot of norms that that are rules that people have to follow. As the domain becomes more congested, more contested, more competitive, I see the need for rules of the road. I'm not naive to think that if we have rules of the road, uh, that everybody's going to follow them. But I do think it's going to help us identify those folks that are running the red lights and, and not playing by the rules. Uh, we're working this very closely with our allies and our partners. Uh, we war game uh, these, these uh, uh, discussions on, on norms of behavior. Uh, we we uh, work together on um, coming up with what we, what we might consider responsible uh, uses of space and, and, and norms of behavior. The Secretary of Defense has, has signed out a memo that, that outlines uh, some fundamental rules that we're going to play by. One of them that right off the top is, you know, that we are not going to um, uh, let me quote it. I've got, let me uh, uh, limit the generation of long lived debris. <laughs> I mean, that's clearly not what Russia did. And so the way we're, we're getting after this is we're operating that way uh, today and trying to, to demonstrate safe and responsible professional behavior by the way we operate, the way we operate with our allies and partners, and the way we're tr being transparent across the globe with many of our partners. And, and um, you know, uh, it, it becomes clear then. Uh, who isn't playing by those rules and operating in the safe safe manner? But I, I think it's really important going forward. I'm I'm actually encouraged that that um, uh, th that the conversation is picking up. I'm very encouraged that the Secretary of Defense signed out this memo that that listed some basic tenets that we're going to follow by, and and the way we operate is in line with those with those tenets. All right, I, I want to turn now um, to some questions from the audience, and, and this is one in particular that I was interested in as well, is what do you think the role um, of the Space Force uh, should be uh, in cislunar space and, you know, even you know, potentially on the surface of the moon? How does that fit into your strategic and tactical plans? Um, and, you know, I'm also interested in what time horizon do you think cislunar space starts to become, uh, you know, particularly important for the military? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I think one of the things that, you know, people, I think um, when you think about uh, the Space Force and NASA, there's a lot of confusion still amongst, you know, today and across the country about the role of each. And I think before you can get into cislunar operations between the two, I think you have to look at just what are the roles of a, an armed service, a military service, vice NASA. We're a military service, uh, you know, providing capabilities for our country's way of life and our way of war and making sure that that domain is safe and stable um, so all can operate in it. NASA has the, has the mission of exploration and science. And, and I think for them to do their job, uh, they have to have a domain that's safe and secure and stable and we protect US astronauts from debris types of things. I mean, we wanna, we wanna be that, that, that body. As NASA moves out beyond uh, low Earth orbit with the International Space Station uh, uh, and, and has stated uh, you know, that we're on our way back to the moon, hopefully here in the, in the not too distant future, uh, I believe there, there will be value in having some domain awareness of the area that they're going to operate in. And so as the nation goes further away, as the world goes further away from the Earth, I think there's going to be a requirement to have uh, at least at, at a minimum some domain awareness 
on, on that environment. So then if you look at the time frame of that, I would say in kind of the next five to 10 years, uh, we're going to have to have some capability to be able to, to support those operations. And then uh, additionally, then you also have to think about the military utility uh, aspect and competition with, with uh, our our pacing challenge or China and the work that they're doing, making sure that we uh, compete in all areas of the domain, not just in low earth orbit or medium earth orbit or, or geosynchronous orbit. And, you know, another question uh, from the audience here, um, just asking you to clarify earlier comment um, about the uh, amount of diversity in the Space Force, that 35% diversity, what does that represent? Is that racial minorities? Uh, does it include gender? That, I think that it, it includes, I think, all of the above. It specifically, uh, those numbers, I think, were more gender focused. In fact, if you look at the, if you look at the 118, um, if you look at the 118 cadets that came out of the Air Force Academy a year ago, so almost you know last May uh, when they got commissioned, of the 118, nearly 40% were female, uh, and and so uh, we think that's significant. I remember when we first stood up the Space Force. I was overseas in Europe, uh, and we were having a dinner on a, a policy focused dinner. And a gentleman that was sitting next to me uh, from the UK said, you know, General Raymond, you're lucky. You can slap the table tomorrow and say, we're going to have a force that's 50% female, X percent diverse and, you know, in other areas. And I started thinking about it and really I can't, I'm not, you know, by law, you can't, you can't do the quotas, but I started thinking about it. Uh, what might we do to, to have a force uh, that, that will be a more ready, uh, more mission capable force. I, I tell a story of, I was at Naval War College years ago and I was in a, a seminar for the first, I think it was about first four or five months of the year uh, we were in our first seminar and there was 14 people in the seminar. 13 folks were military and there was one individual from the State Department, a guy named Andrew Steinfeld. He later on became the poll lad for the chairman. Uh, uh, really bright guy. And on every topic at the end of your, every class session, if you will, when it came time to putting together, formulating an answer to a problem, the 13 military folks said, oh, here's what we're going to do. And they're pounding the table. And we all grew up the same way. We all were trained the same way. We might have been in different services, but we were all we kind of grew up thinking the same way. And then Andrew would say, hey, let me give you another perspective and would give a State Department perspective and a worldview that, that was very informed and uh, we had maybe not had thought through as well as we should have. And by the end of that session, we came up with an answer that was actually a better answer. And so that has always stuck with me that, that we want to have diversity of lots of diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of skill set, uh, uh, diversity in backgrounds. And I think that helps us get to a, get to a stronger answer. That's great. Um, uh, let's see, uh, another question here from the audience uh, is, can you discuss the relationship with Space Command? Uh, now, obviously, you were dual-hatted for a while with both jobs, but, um, you know, you, you've, unlike the other military services, the Space Force seems to be uniquely aligned with a particular combatant command. Um, you know, so how is that relationship working, the division of responsibilities, and do you still see that there are significant uh, roles for Space Force personnel in the other combatant commands? You talked earlier about setting up a Space Force component in the other COCOMs, but you can kind of tell us what are their roles and responsibilities? How does that differ from what U.S. Space Command is doing? Uh, you know, so it's, it's normalized business. Uh, as you know, with Goldwater Nichols, um, the, the department is kind of broken up into two functions. One is an organized training and equip function, and one is a is a more operational or warfighting function, one being services and one being combatant commands. What makes us a little unique in, in Space Force and Space Command, first of all, what made us unique was we were commanded by the same person for about the, for the first year. And that, that I think, um, blurred the conversation a little bit. It, it, we didn't have to be as precise in our language because it was, hey, throw it over space and they'll, they'll figure it out. Now we have two different organizations, you know, two different leaders, two different organizations is absolutely the right answer. There's a different mission for both of them. Our job is to organize, train, and equip and to operate those capabilities. And when they're employed, they, they're, done, they, they're employed under the authorities of a combatant commander. And, and so if you think about it that way, normalized business, it, 
it's it's the easy button to, to figure out. Uh, the challenge becomes because there's such a tight relationship because almost all of our forces that, that we provide are force presented or assigned forces to US Space Command. Then the question becomes, do you have to have a relationship with the other combatant commands? And I uh, fully uh, think that you have to. Uh, US Space Command uh, will be much uh, more uh, capable uh, and if they have regional, uh, if I have components in, in, in the different uh, regional combatant commands, geographic combatant commands, they can help them uh, understand the domain, operate in the domain and do, the, do their mission. So there's a balance there. I think General Dickinson and I are in complete lockstep on this. He, he wholeheartedly agrees with the service component structure uh, for the Space Force. We're now thinking through how we might do that. We wouldn't want to create increased bureaucracy. I, yeah, I, when I was a colonel, I deployed in theater to uh, CENTCOM AOR, and I was the director of Space Forces. I worked in the, the chaos. It was a career changer for me. It completely changed my view of space. It helped professionally develop me uh, to, 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 to have the, the skill set that I need uh, to do the job that, I, that I'm doing today. And so for a whole host of reasons, uh, I think there's incredible value in having some regional expertise. The other piece is the combatant commands need to have some space expertise in their combatant commands uh, to, to understand that domain because they're completely reliant on everything that we have in space to do their to do their jobs. Their jobs, their missions don't close without space. They need to understand that. And so having having uh, cap people in place in theater uh, is really important. It's not just really important for the Space Force. It's really important for U.S. Space Command that those exist as well. Um, and so we've done a lot of work, General Dickinson and I have done a lot of work on, on, on uh, crafting what that looks like. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to, to get those stood up. Uh, and another question here from the audience uh, about, uh, you know, innovation and investment in new technologies. And so, you know, one of the arguments you hear is, you know, DOD and the federal government in general are spending a relatively smaller share on R&D compared to what's going on in the private sector. And really the private sector investment in R&D is just enormous now. Um, and you know, the, you know, the question here is, you know, the commercial market investment in R&D is attracting a lot of the talent, uh, then arguably the, the center for innovation uh, is moving into the commercial sector. And we see that happening in the, the space commercial industrial base in particular, a lot of really innovative work going on there, a lot of talented people being attracted there. Um, Congress has also, of course, been pushing the Space Force uh, to leverage commercial space capabilities in legislation. So you know, what can you tell us about what the Space Force is doing to better leverage those advancements that are happening in commercial space capabilities? Yeah, so every time I talk, you know, I, I went, so, so when I was growing up in the Air Force as a young captain, I was the commercial space officer at Air Force Base Command for three years. I, I have a, a close affinity to the commercial space business. I see the value that it provides us back his, in, in historically what it has provided us is commercial launch and communi commercial communication satellites, you know, large communication satellites. What we're seeing now is as commercial launch has really helped bring the launch costs down, uh, the, the access to the domain has been, is, or, or barriers to, to entry into the domain have been reduced. What used to be great power competition between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, now is, is devolved down to we have students launching satellites. And so uh, there's great value to be had. I, I say in almost every speech I give on this topic, I say that US commercial industry is a great um, uh, advantage for our nation and we need to capitalize on it. And uh, it is hard to work as hard and as much emphasis as we put on uh, being able to to uh, to partner with commercial, there it hasn't it, it hasn't been without challenges. And I think one of the things that I've that I've realized is it, you can't just start with the acquisition part of it. You have to start uh, much earlier on in the design of it. And if you build constellations that allow for that com that commercial investment to be relevant, I think you can actually bring them in earlier and and have greater need. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I want to do more. We're committed to doing more. I appreciate Congress's focus on it. We're focused on it. Uh, we've stood up uh, some things, a couple of things that I'm really proud of uh, 
we have something called Spec OT, where we're, we've broadened the industrial base and, and partners that out at Space Systems Command, where where we have a, a, a pool of partners and a significant portion of those are non-traditional uh, partners that are part of that. We've set up a SpaceWorks. Um, our our uh, goal, though, is to not just um, our, our goal is to to build more more opportunities into the design of our architecture so we can get we can uh, capitalize on it even more. You know, um, one of the interesting things that came out of this year's NDAA as well was uh, it created, created the number of reviews uh, that DODS did conduct and some independent commissions. And one of them was Congress mandated a full review of classified space systems. Um, and the intention, of course, is, you know, to, you know, see if there's areas where we can downgrade classification or even declassify uh, some things. Now, I know this is something that you have talked about publicly before that we're overly classified General Hyten, you know, the outgoing vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who had also been a previous you know, commander of Air Force Space Command, has also said the same thing now. Um, with two powerful four star generals like you having championed this for so long, um, you know, it's got a lot of people scratching their head of why have we not made more progress? Um, you know, now Congress has established this commission. So, you know, how do you think it'll be different this time? And, and how do you see, you know, the Space Force going about carrying out this review and, and hopefully getting some results in the end? Yeah, so, so a couple of things. One, I think it's critical that the work gets done. And, I, and I've been passionate about this for, for years. We have made some progress uh, in, I mentioned GMTI, we, we reduced the classification. What I've learned is it's really easy for a young action officer to classify something at a really high level. And it's really, really hard then to declassify that once it gets classified. It's, it's unbelievable what you have to go through to, to get something uh, reduced down to a, to a lower level. And so I think there's an education part of this, but I've also learned the space part clearly is uh, one of our most classified areas across the you know, model of overclassification across the department. Um, and not only were we overly classified, but we're, we're overly classified kind of in a non-normal way, <laughs> the way the normal bureaucracy does it. And so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, we, we've also been doing a lot of work on the strategy part on, because our, because our job, our main job is to deter conflict from beginning or extending in the space. It's really difficult to be able to do that if, if everything is classified and you can't talk about it. And so we've also done a lot of work on the strategy pieces of this. And I think as the department moves towards an integrated deterrence strategy uh, as part of the national defense strategy, that's also going to um, raise the importance uh, across the department. Clearly, space will be a key part of that, uh, of getting after this. So I'm, I'm encouraged that that uh, we're going to make some some much needed progress on this front. We've made some already, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that with the broader strategy work and then with with the uh, work that Congress is directed in the law that, that uh, we'll be able to really move out and make some differences. Now we're running close on time here. I got one final question for you. Um, Joint All Domain Command and Control, JADC2, uh, has been a big focus area in recent years for the department, for the Air Force. Um, and I just wanted to get a quick update from you. You know, what do you see the Space Force's role uh, in JAD C2, um, and you know, are we going to hear more uh, in terms of linkages between programs or maybe new programs uh, from the Space Force that are intended to support JAD C2? Yeah, so you know, I, um, if you just look at JAD C2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, uh, space puts the the all you know is one of the domains that puts the all domain into that definition. We have to have the ability. If you're to ask any warfighting commander, uh, what do you need to, to do your mission? There's there's a couple of things that they probably will tell you. One, they have to have domain awareness. They have to have whatever domain they're operating in, they have to have a level of awareness, and then they have to have a, the ability to command and control their forces. Um, and so it's really important to us. We've been, uh, I've, I've you know been saying kind of uh, tongue in cheek, we've been uh, joint, we've been JADC2 before it was cool. We've been working really hard on this this joint all domain command and control uh, piece, we made some really good progress in uh, some capabilities that that we've built on the space side of the house that that better integrate uh, 
with um, with other domains, uh, specifically the air domain. Uh, I would also say that one of the one of the the key pieces of JADC2 is the ability to get the, you know it's the linking sensor to shooter and being able to take data and and transport that data uh, for decision makers. And I really believe that uh, the work that we're doing on the force design for a, a data transport layer will really be uh, a key part of that. Our our big focus for the first couple of years of the Space Force on C2 was, was data. Uh, the domain that we operate in is a domain that we operate in and we experience through data. And unless you're one of a handful of astronauts that have had the opportunity to, to more than a handful, but not many that have gone into space across history and lived in the domain, uh, you don't experience that domain in person, you experience it through data. And so we've really been focusing on building the data architecture, if you will, uh, for being able to solve a lot of the challenges that we have, that which are big data challenges, and so uh, I, I believe Space Force has a has a critical role in this and data and being able to transport data, uh, and then having the ability to command and control our forces uh, in a way that lends itself to integrated deterrence uh, across all domains is going to be really important, and I think you'll see that uh, continue to be a a. a, a a uh, broad effort for the, the broader department and clearly an effort on the Space Force side as well. All right, I see we're out of time. This has been a really Let's great keep going. discussion. <laughs> well, if you've got if you got time for one more question. <laughs> I do. If you got time, I got time. All right, let's do let's do one more question here. Um, you know, uh, you've you know talked a lot about how the Space Force has made strides in collaborating with international partners. Um, question from the audience here is do the, the way you collaborate and the way you interact with uh, other countries, you know, when it comes to military space, is there a noticeable difference between the more advanced space powers uh, and the more emerging space powers, if you will? Are there different challenges and opportunities depending there, on which there, country? There are different challenges and different opportunities. I will tell you, though, the way the domain has changed, even though we've been operating in the domain for 50 years, uh, you know, or, or, you know, since the 50s. The domain has really changed, so we don't have all the answers either. And and so uh, it's good to have conversations with the whole spectrum of, of partners. So we obviously have some partners that that our partnerships uh, yield uh, capabilities, more near term capabilities. Uh, uh, you know, we we uh, leverage information from Canada on space situational awareness, for example. Uh, there's others where it's more just uh, sharing information and data and thought. We're not, we exercise together, we train together. Uh, we, you know, for some that have space operation centers, our, our space operation centers are linked together. As we develop C2 tools, we develop those jointly to, to put not just at our U.S. space C2 centers, but at, at our closest partner C2 centers as well. And we're now at the point where we're actually building capabilities together. And so uh, I've, I've talked about this. I know many people have heard me say this in the past, but, you know, we had a requirement to build communication uh satellites that were going to cover cover the northern part of the globe. Um, it was going to uh, take us a few more years to get done, uh, and it was going to cost us a significant amount of dollars to build two satellites. And we went to Norway, who was building two satellites already. We said, can we just put our payloads on your satellites? It saved us over $900 million and will get us onto orbit three years faster. We have international partnerships with Japan where we're putting hosted payloads on what they call a QCSS satellite, which is their GPS augmentation satellite, if you will. Uh, there's other partnerships that we're working uh, capabilities on. Uh, we have other partnerships where, where countries buy into WGS, for example, and AEHF. There's all kinds of part ways to do these partnerships. Our, my intent is to grow those partnerships uh, and, and to uh, continue to develop uh, develop emerging partners and mature the ones that we have. Yes, there's a difference, but we're all in this together. And I think the value of these partnerships can't be, can't be overstated. All right, and really the final question. Uh, if you have to compare the threats posed in the space domain by Russia and China, I'm not gonna ask you to rank them, but how do you see the similarities and differences posed by Russia and China when it comes to space? Uh, well, I think, I, I, I don't even think you have to say as it comes to space. I think just in general, uh, well, as it comes to space, I think both countries uh, realize that, that and have stated, I mean, and have demonstrated by their actions that, that they're, um, 
developing capabilities to deny us our access to space and the advantages that it provides. And we've seen that on full display uh, here over the, the last uh, set of years. Um, I, I think they both are developing capabilities for their own use. Uh, you know, China has built a, a very robust space architecture uh, that will give them the same advantages that, that, that we have, and they're becoming more dependent on space. And their, their space capabilities are critical linkages and their ability to, to do what they're, uh, the, the, uh, you know, to, to do military, their military operations. Uh, I think what's different is that China has gone uh, very, very fast. Uh, and I think they, the economic engine that they have has allowed them to go at a speed that is really concerning. And I think that's why I would consider them our pacing challenge. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll let that be the final word. I, I want to thank you thank so you. much, General Raymond, for joining us today and, and thank the audience. A lot of great questions and couldn't get to them all uh, in the amount of time we had. Uh, but thank you. And we hope to have you back for another discussion. Yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, post budget at some point as you can fit it into your schedule. I would love to I'd love to have another session and, and talk about uh, uh, in more detail uh, what I think is going to be a, a a significant uh, advantage for our country that we're delivering. And I, again, sign me up whenever you can fit into your schedule. All right, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, and maybe we can be in person by then. I would, I would <laughs> hope so. Happy birthday, right. sir. Thank you.